Today we're going to speak about the anisong or advantage of new life. In order to understand new life fully, we need to reconsider the words new and old a little more. In doing so, we'll take the story of Adam and Eve as the basis for this consideration. For Adam and Eve, before they ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, there was no dukkha. That was the old life for them. The old life for Adam and Eve was the freedom from attachment before they knew good and evil. <clears throat> Once eating that fruit, it became the new life, the new life of attachment and dukkha. Now, for us, we talk the other way around. When we talk about the old life, we mean the old life of attachment and dukkha, because this is all that we've ever known. We don't we don't have memories of of life when there was no attachment and dukkha. So from this attachment to good and evil, we are in the old life, our old life. Through letting go of these attachments, then there is the new life that is freedom from dukkha. So what is old for us is new was new for Adam and Eve, and what was old for Adam and Eve is new for us. These words, old and new, can be ambiguous. So be careful about how we use them. Don't get caught in the words, but understand the meaning. So you know what we're talking about when we talk about new life. When we take Adam and Eve as the standard, new life means the life of dukkha. And old life means the life before attachment began, the old life that was free of dukkha. But when we take ourselves as the standard, then new life is the life that is free of dukkha, free of attachment. And old life is the life of getting caught up in good and evil, of attaching to good and evil. Oh, yes, and experiencing dukkha be because of that. So it depends on whether we take Adam and Eve or ourselves as the standard. When we speak about new life, and the advantage of new life, then we'll be speaking of new life in terms of freedom from dukkha. And the advantage of new life, when there is freedom from attachment in dukkha, is that there is no death. The advantage of new life, when we have transcended the old ways of attachment and dukkha and realized new life, that is freedom from death. We also need to consider the meaning of the word good. The good is something that we're always after. We always want the good we always want better. We always want the best. But as it says in the Bible, through knowing good and evil, through attaching to the good and the evil, 
This just leads to disputes, quarrels, aggression, and argument. Because the more there is attachment to the good, the more, the more conflict and problems arise because of this attachment. So using good, the word good in this way, is the way of common ordinary language. This is how most people speak, using the word good in this way. They're speaking the language of attachment. But that kind of good is not absolute truth. It's only a relative kind of truth, relative to the attachments and limitations of ordinary people. If we become interested in absolute truth, then we have to think of another kind of good. But here we're falling into the problems of the ambiguity of this word good. So we can talk about another kind of good, a kind of good that is above good, the good that is beyond good. <clears throat> Or, to make it easier to avoid this ambiguity, we can use a different word. And in Buddhism, we use the word void or empty. So in, if we're still interested in the good, then, then we're still thinking in relative terms. We need to distinguish between two kinds of good. There's the kind of good that leads to death, the good of death, which is the, the limited attached to good. And then there is another kind of good, which is freedom from death. And this is what we call voidness. So we need to see these two different meanings of the word good. If you want to use good and beyond good, we we'll use goodness and voidness. The thing is to understand the meanings, because the more we attach to the good, the more obsessed we get with it, and the more locked up we are into those limited ways of perceiving things. So we need to get be we need to go above that kind of good to the good that is voidness. So we've got this dilemma of what words to use in, to describe these things. What's the best word to use? If we say beyond good or above good, most people won't understand what we mean by that. They'll listen and be confused because they've never thought of some kind of something that is above good. They're so caught up in the good that they've never thought of anything above that. And so they don't understand the meaning. But if we use the word void or empty, these same people will think that we're talking we're saying that there is nothing, that there is complete a vacuum. And so we have to be very careful about the words we use. We have to really consider the best words to use. Because when ordinary people are listening, they easily misunderstand the meaning. But for those who really begin to understand this matter, then they'll see that the word void or empty is the, the correct word to use. The arahant, the noble ones or the perfected enlightened beings, have seen that the good is just, it's too much to bear. <laughs> it causes too many problems. The better, the worse it is, and the best is the worst of all. And so they've seen that the good and the best and the better, 
That's not it. It's voidness. So if we if we see this, then we'll be we'll see that we need to use or that the best word to use is void or voidness. But to help people out, we'll say in parentheses above good, just to help clarify it a bit. So we're talking about voidness above good. You all know that the word good is considered positive. Good is a good word. <laughs> it has positive meaning for us. But liberation, transcendence, is above positive. It's above the positive. So we can't use the word good when we're talking about liberation. The more we use the word good, the more wicked we get, the more messed up the situation becomes. So we have to use the word void. So we use the word void based on the, the fairly easy to understand principle that above evil is good and above good is voidness. So we all know that good is better than evil, but there's something above the good. This is voidness. Now if we talk this way around most people, they won't know what we're talking about. We, we have to be very careful about speaking in this, in this way. If you walk into the market and start talking about above good, people will think you're crazy because they've never, to them, there is nothing above the good. The good is the highest thing there is. And so it becomes very difficult when we use this word good. If we say the good is above the good, and they say the good is the good because there's nothing above the good, then we just get into arguments and disputes about this. So we need to be very, very careful. If we want, we can talk about good goodness according to nature. If we examine nature, we'll see that there is neither good nor evil. There is just the process of phenomena, of conditioning, according to itapajayata, according to the law of cause and effect. There is only itapajayata, there is neither good nor evil. So to see good in terms of nature is to see it in this way, that there is only itapajayata. But once again, this is still difficult for some people to understand. And so we, we always have to be careful about how we use this word, good. So we can talk about voidness. Itapajayata is voidness. So now let's consider life. We all know that a wicked life is terrible. <laughs> it's unendurable. But we also now understand that the good life or a good life is also too much to bear because in the good life one is dying constantly. One dies all the time. And so there, we need to be above evil and above good, beyond good, beyond evil. 
that is void. So if we talk about a life that is void, most of our friends won't know what we're talking about. So we have to be careful just as much with this. It will take a while, maybe a long, long time of patience, of trying to create understanding between us until our friends will begin to understand what we mean by a life that is void. If we're not careful, this, when we use these words, they'll just, there'll be arguments, disputes, confusion, and we'll get mad at each other and then never speak to each other again. That's not the right way. So we need to use these words carefully and patiently work to bring understanding between us. So we talk about the life that is void, which is the good life in terms of nature. Good in terms of nature is voidness, is itapajayata. So we need to see life in this way, that wicked life is too much for us to handle, and that the good life is also constant death, but that the empty life, the void life, is what is beyond good, beyond evil, and beyond death. Now most of, many of you should know, at least in, in the terms of words and intellectual understanding, what me, we mean by the word an empty life or a void life, because we've just explained it. But even though we've explained it clearly, you still may not like this kind of thing. You may not inter be interested in it because you still have your old views, opinions, and sensitivities with you. And for many people, when they hear void or empty, to them that is negative. To understand voidness in this way is incorrect. Voidness is beyond both positive and negative. But Sometimes our old habits of thinking will confuse us on this matter. But when we say voidness, it's above the positive and above the negative. So this is why we need to be careful about how we view all this with our old old ways of thinking and begin to see it in a new, fresh perspective. So now we can see that the meaning of voidness is to be above all the different pairs of opposites, good and evil, positive, negative, and all the, the things which come in opposing pairs. To transcend these is what we mean by voidness. So then you can see that when we use the word void, it has no opposite. Void does not have an opposite. It is something where there is nothing in opposition to it. There's just voidness. And so realizing voidness and emptiness is to transcend to be liberated from all the pairs of opposites with which bind us. These, these dualistic ways of viewing things tie us up. They bind us and chain us. To transcend these pairs of opposites is to be free. This is the meaning of freedom and liberation. It's to go beyond all these pairs of opposites, to transcend them so that the mind is free. This is the advantage of new life, 
New life is the life that is void, the life that is free, that have, is no longer tied up and bound by the very many pairs of opposites. So when we talk about new life from the, in terms of fundamental principles, in terms of the basic principles, this is the advantage of new life. It's liberation and freedom. So if we look and see the influence which the pairs of opposites have over us, we'll begin to see all the dukkha in, in being caught up and bound by all these pairs of opposites. To be free of that is, is the voidness. To be free of all the pairs of opposites, of good and evil, winning and losing, positive and negative, pessimism and optimism, getting, losing, male, female, hot, cold, debt, loss, advantage, disadvantage. To go beyond all these is the voidness. Even with something like happiness, it's, it's the same story. Happiness, for most people, is considered to be something positive. Happiness is good. That's how most people think. But if we say that genuine happiness is beyond happiness, then they have the same problem as they have with the word good. Happiness is above unhappiness, but voidness is above happiness. So if we say that genuine happiness is voidness, people are confused, just the same as when we say above evil is good, above good is void, that genuine good is void. People just aren't aren't willing or aren't able to see what this means. But to get beyond true happiness, the true good, is void. When we say that happiness isn't really happiness, but it's dukkha, people are confused by this because generally they see happiness as positive and dukkha as negative. And so if we say that happiness is dukkha, people will say that that's pessimistic. But they're missing the point. The point is that true happiness is that the regular common kind of happiness that they're thinking about is always caught up in dukkha. These two, you can't have one without the other. They're inseparable. So to really be free of dukkha, we need to go beyond happiness as well, and that's the voidness. The voidness is ne neither pessimistic or op optimistic, neither positive or negative. It's void. It's free of all these opposites. Now let's consider the best. Every one of you wants the best, the best this, the best that. We're really interested in the best. But what do we mean by the best? What is the meaning of the best? In universal ethics, in all the, the various schools of ethics, it's always talking about how to bring the best thing to man. So in ethics, they're talking about the, the sumum banum, the utmost or the highest good. So we're, people all over the place are talking about the best, about the highest good. But what do they mean by these things? In different schools, we don't really know what they're talking about. It's very difficult for us to understand or accept what they say is the highest good. But the thing that is really the best or the highest good is void, voidness. And the 
the highest voidness or the the complete most perfect voidness is nibbana so in buddhism if we talk about the best we're talking about nibbana if we're talking about the highest goodness the utmost goodness we're talking about nibbana which is emptiness voidness complete full perfect voidness so they they may have other meanings in other places for the best and the highest goodness but here nibbana the transcendence of all good and evil that is the the highest thing there is so with this word the best the best in thai there's basically the same kind of problem the best in thai would be more literally the most good and so the more and more good something is we say the crazier and crazier <laughs> it is because of all the problems so in thai as well as in english the word the best or d tisut is a real problem and this is what caused us to start thinking about the latin phrase sumum banum wondering sumum banum this utmost good is utmost higher than the best now we're not that good at english so we're not really sure if utmost is something that's higher that's above the best but we think that it's possible that it is so we're using this word sumambanam with the understanding that the utmost good is beyond the best because utmost is beyond the best and so the utmost good the sunambanam we can use this in hopes that it will be more easily understood by people and then we can say that the utmost good is beyond the best and maybe this will make sense to somebody and say that the utmost good is voidness is nibbana let's look at this word sunambanam a little more from the point of view of universal ethics according to universal ethics there are three aspects or three com- or four aspects or four components to the sunambanam the first is happiness the second is human perfectedness the third is duty for duty's sake and the fourth is universal love as if these four are completed and perfected that is the sunambanam the utmost good according to universal ethics and so we've got the same problem once again even with this explanation of sunambanam because the first the first component is happiness which we've already discussed most people or just about everyone will see that happiness is something as positive and good and so this is just another opportunity to attach to good and to evil which to us is in no way the highest good the utmost good so we it's very difficult to accept that happiness is the sunambanam so to try and avoid confusion we have to talk about genuine happiness genuine actual happiness is above happiness if we're going to talk about the genuine sunambanam we need to talk about genuine happiness for most people 
happy, happiness is, is some kind of satisfaction in the characteristic of good. It's being satisfied or pleased with things that are characterized as good. This is happiness in the ordinary understanding. Genuine happiness is beyond this, it's completely free of this. Genuine happiness is the void, is Nibbana. So to talk about the Sunambanam correctly, we need to understand genuine happiness. If we only see happiness in the ordinary terms, it will just cause all sorts of problems because it's another source of attachment which leads to dukkha. So to understand sunambanam, think in terms of genuine happiness, being free of ordinary happiness, being free of the happiness which is bound up with dukkha, being free of all that, voidness, nibbana. This is the sumambanam, the true sumambanam. In Buddhism, we have the very fundamental principle or tenet that Nibbana is the utmost emptiness. Nibbanang paramang sunyang. Nibbana is the utmost voidness or utmost emptiness. This needs to be understood in order to, and, and needs to be kept in mind, in order to avoid getting lost in the common, ordinary meanings of happiness in Sunambanam. If we see that Nibbana is the utmost voidness, then we can begin to understand what the true, genuine Sunambanam is. We also need to straighten out the two words emptiness and voidness because these can be mixed up. Now we've said what the meaning of voidness is. Now if emptiness means that there is nothing, that there is a vacuum, complete nothingness, if this is the meaning of emptiness, then we cannot use the word empty or emptiness in place of void or voidness. Because voidness does not mean nothing. When we see that, say that there is voidness, everything can exist in the voidness, in the void. Nothing, nothing is absent. Everything can exist in the void. So if emptiness means that nothing exists, that there is nothing absolutely whatsoever, then we cannot use this word emptiness in place of the voidness. But if we understand emptiness to mean that everything can exist in this emptiness, that everything does exist in this emptiness, then we can use it in place of voidness. Because voidness simply means that everything, everything exists, but in all of these existing things, there is nothing that we can take as a self. And voidness is that there is nothing in all this that can be taken as a self. But all this is, all this is. So understand the meanings of voidness and See if does emptiness have this same meaning as voidness. Nibbana is the utmost, is the complete, the fullest voidness. So in Nibbana there is everything, but in Nibbana there is no self. There is nothing about Nibbana that we can take or attach to as a self. So please get these two words straight and understand them properly. Here's an easy, easier example. 
in voidness, in the void, everything exists. There is everything. For example, there is there are the four elements, the element of earth. The element of earth genuinely exists, but there is no self. There is no earth self or no self of earth in that. And the element of water exists. This element of cohesion genuinely, truly is in the void. However, it is void in that it has no self. There is no water self or self of water, no permanent essential essence of water. And the same with the elements of wind and fire. These genuinely exist. All these elements exist, but they are void of self. So the words emptiness and voidness, it's up to you, you native speakers of English, the owners of this language, to straighten out the meanings of these words. When we say the voidness, you know what that means, that everything exists, that there is everything, but they are void of self. But if emptiness means that there is nothing, that there is nothing at all, then this doesn't, it, this isn't the same as voidness. So you that know the English language well, please help us to sort out these words. And when we talk about the utmost goodness, when we talk about Nibbana, realize and understand we're talking about voidness. In Nibbana, Nibbana it genuinely exists. Nibbana exists, but it is free of self. There is no self in Nibbana. So when we're talking about Nibbana, the utmost goodness, Understand that we're talking about this voidness where there is no attachment to good or to evil, to happiness or unhappiness. It's complete freedom from all self and from all set, from all attachment that gives rise to self. So if we say that Nibbana is the utmost voidness, realize that things actually exist. Nibbana exists. It's something real, but it is empty, excuse me, it is void of self. Or if we say that Nibbana is the utmost happiness, then understand what kind of happiness we're talking about. We're not talking about the common, ordinary happiness that most people are talking about. We're talking about genuine happiness that is above both happiness and unhappiness. This kind of happiness is also void. This happiness that is beyond happiness is also void. It has no self. It, there is in it no self. It has no, no opposite. But this thing really exists. So we talk about Nibbana. We talk about the utmost, the utmost good. We talk, and these are all the void, where there is no attachment to good or to evil, to positive or negative, or anything. And so the self does not arise. So here's something to, something easy to remember. Please, please remember this. The supreme happiness is when we don't attach to happiness as happiness. The supreme happiness is when there is no attachment to happiness as happiness. This is the meaning of, this is the sunambanam. You can take this, this meaning of genuine happiness as the sunambanam. 
when we attach to happiness as happiness, then that is not voidness, that is not freedom. When we attach to dukkha as dukkha, that is also not freedom, and there is no happiness in that. But to neither attach to happiness as happiness or dukkha as dukkha, that is the supreme happiness, that is the utmost good. So we can take this as our, our meaning of the utmost good, the sunambanam, when there is no attachment to happiness as happiness. That is the supreme, the utmost happiness. Please, please remember this. So this, this utmost happiness we're talking about, we don't, we don't know if most people are willing to accept it or pay attention to when we say that genuine happiness is not attaching to happiness is happiness. But for Buddhists, those who know, those who are awake, those who are blossoming forth, this is the true meaning of happiness, of genuine happiness. So now it's time to also take a look at the words supreme and real, or real or genuine. Many people would say that the supreme is the same as the best, and so we fall into the same problem we've been talking about all morning. If the supreme is the best, then it's just the ordinary, unsatisfying, dukkha kind of happiness. It can't be depended on. So understand that when we talk about, if you're going to use, if we use the word supreme, it needs to mean the same as real and genuine, which means that it's not the kind of, it means to be above the best, above the good. But we think that it might be better to just to stick with the word real or genuine, to use the word real happiness. Because by the real happiness, this is when there is no attachment to happiness or to the best or to the good or to evil or the worst or to unhappiness. So real happiness is when there's no attachment to happiness or unhappiness, sukha or dukkha. We can look at this from another perspective as well and see that there are two kinds of happiness. There is the happiness that creates problems and the happiness that doesn't create problems. This happiness that creates problems is the happiness that's involved with attachment and all those limitations in being caught and bound up in the self. This happiness that does not create problems, this is what we can take to be the supreme happiness. The kind of happiness that does not lead to problems is the supreme happiness. But you have to understand that this kind of happiness that doesn't cause problems comes from non-attachment to things as good, non-attachment to evil, non-attachment to happiness, non-attachment to unhappiness, to positive and negative, or anything whatsoever. So this happiness that doesn't cause problems is the supreme happiness which is above all attachment. This we can also say is real, genuine happiness. So we have these four aspects or four meanings of sunambanam. The first one was happiness. The second one is human perfection. So let's look at that now. What's the meaning of human perfection? What is genuine human perfection? 
Human perfection is the fullness, the completion of what it means to be human. For this human perfection, there is no room for attachment. For human perfection, this is freedom from all attachment to good and to evil, to happiness and unhappiness. So to be truly perfect, there must be freedom from attachment, there must be voidness. True human perfection is voidness. If there is any attachment to good and evil, happiness or whatever, then there is still something missing and that is not the perfection of humanity. So, the second aspect of the Sunambanam is, is also voidness, is freedom from attachment. In Thailand, to say that someone is not full or not complete is a grave insult. This is a very, this is one of the most powerful and nasty criticisms that there are in Thailand. Which is kind of funny because none of us are full, none of us are complete. Even the person who criticizes somebody else for not being full, even that person is not full, not complete. So all of us are still not complete. Because to be full, to be complete, to be perfect, is to be free of attachment. So long as there is attachment to anything whatsoever, even the smallest attachment, then there is still an opening for dukkha to arise. And so that is not fullness, that is not perfection. So though we, though we may insult each other as being incomplete or imperfect, we have to look and see that all of us are in the same shape. We're still attaching, we're still susceptible to dukkha. To be free of all that, all the attachment in dukkha is the, the true meaning of fullness, the true meaning of perfection. So we need to understand what we mean by fullness or completeness, by perfection, and that this is voidness, this freedom from, from all the problems and hassles. This is what it means to be full or complete. A person who is full or complete or perfected is called an arahant. An arahant means a perfected being. Perfected being, one who is complete, is someone who has no wishes, no hopes, no expectations, no doubts, no uncertainties. They don't have to spend any time in doubt and confusion about what to do, about what is. They have no expectations and no hopes and wishes. This is the meaning of an arahant, of a person who is complete, who is perfected. Somebody who is not yet, not yet full, not yet perfected, has still has doubts and confusion about what one is, about what is, about what to do, about what is the true goal, has, has wishes and hopes and expectations. So this, this is because of the attachments. So understand the difference between human perfection and human imperfection in order to understand the meaning of sunam banam in its genuine sense. The word arahant is often translated improperly. 
Ardahan, A-R-A-H-A-N-T, or T-A. The meaning of Arahan, or Arahanta, is one who is that way, or one who is such, like that, or such, one who is such. This is the meaning of Arahanta. Or, we can say it is the condition of one who is that way, the condition of one who is thus. This is the meaning of Arahanta, which we have just said is the meaning of human perfection. If we take it, the word literally and dissect it according to its roots, Araha means far from, be distant from dukkha and the cause of dukkha, i.e. the defilements. Ta means the state of, so Arahanta is the state of being far from dukkha and from defilements. Literally it says far from, distant from dukkha and the defilements that cause dukkha. But this has basically the same meaning as being free of dukkha, of not having any dukkha, not having any defilements. So this is the meaning of arahan, one who is such, distant from dukkha and the defilements. This is what we're talking about when we talk about human perfection. An arahanta is this way because there is no attachment. Attachment gives rise to defilements which cause dukkha. For an arahant, there are no attachments to anything as mine, as I, as me, as myself. And so one is far from dukkha. An arahant is far from dukkha. There may be dukkha in the world, but the arahanta is far from that dukkha. So this is the correct meaning of arahanta, which is human perfection, the, the second sunambanam. You can see that the, the goal and end of human life is arah, arahantship, to be an arahanta, to be an arahant. To be an arahant is to be free of dukkha, free of attachment, free of the defilement. So this is what human life is about. This is the goal of our lives, is to become an arahant or to realize the state of arahanta, of being distant from dukkha and the defilements that cause dukkha. The advantage of new life is that new life is to have entered upon the path which is certain of realizing arahantship, of certain of achieving or realizing the condition of arahanta. This is the advantage of new life, is that reaching the point where one is assured, or where arahantship is assured, that it will definitely come about, it will definitely be realized. This is the advantage of new life. So we can summarize this all with saying that chiwit mai, new life, is to enter upon the path that leads to, that becomes, that realizes arahantship. This is the meaning of human perfection, the second, second of the sunambanams. So please remember this and please, please don't let it float by you. Give it a good look and be interested in 
this new life which puts one on the path to arahantship. Now we come to the third sunambanam, duty for duty's sake. Most of us work and do our various duties for our own sake, or if not for just ourselves, then for our, the sake of our family, the sake of our group, our community, the sake of something that we identify with. But never doing duty just for duty's sake or doing duty for Dhamma's sake. It's always duty for me or mine, not duty for Dhamma, not duty for duty. So this is the important difference here in doing one's duty in an attached way or in a non-attached way. Please understand this to understand this third sunambanam. So when someone works for themselves, for their own sake, there is some attachment involved. They're attaching to some good, some personal good. Through this attachment to the good and this this selfishness, it becomes possible to start doing dishonest, crooked things in order to achieve or get what one considers to be good. So by this beginning of working for oneself or for one's one's own, there is this attachment which can grow into attachment also to evil, to doing wrong in order to get what is good for oneself or what one wants, what one thinks is good. In this way, there are more and more people working only for themselves. They are not working for Dhamma, not working for truth, not even working for the good of all. This is to to work very incorrectly. To work correctly is to do one's duty for duty's sake or to work for Dhamma. This is the the way to bring genuine peace into the world. So long as we're working for ourselves, working for our own, then there can be no peace. Because of this attachment, there is always conflict, disputes, and problems arising, both for ourselves and for others. In this selfish working for our own, we always find ourselves in conflict, And this conflict is a great deal of dukkha. And we also fall into times of afflicting others, exploiting others. So there is is dukkha for others. This is the, the result of working for oneself. But in working for Dhamma, in doing duty for duty's sake, there is none of this selfishness in this attachment. So there isn't any of this conflict. And so there are, is no dukkha for oneself or for others. So please memorize the following. Dhamma is duty. Duty is Dhamma. Dhamma is duty. Duty is Dhamma. To really do one's duty is to practice Dhamma. The only way to practice Dhamma to do one's duty. To do do duty for one's own sake or to work for one's own sake is not Dhamma, or that is a crooked kind of Dhamma. To do one's duty crookedly or selfishly is a crooked, dishonest kind of Dhamma. It's not real Dhamma at all. So true Dhamma is to do one's duty self- selflessly. So duty is dhamma, dhamma is duty. To to live in a world together in peace, this is absolutely necessary that we work not for our own sake, but for the sake of dhamma, that we do our duty 
not for our own sake, but for duty's sake. This is the, the meaning of this third sunambanam. This is the advantage of a new life, is doing dhamma by doing one's duty, doing one's duty by practicing dhamma. Even no matter where we are, one must do one's duty. When we are in a temple, we must do the duty required in that time and place. That is to practice dhamma. For a farmer in his field to do the duty that is required in that field at that time for that farmer, that is to practice dhamma. So to constantly be doing one's duty from moment to moment, that is dhamma. This is the third sunambanam, the third meaning or advantage of new life. To do one's duty still doesn't, in doing one's duty, one can still use money, eat food, and do all sorts of different things. The, the thing to realize is that this duty or work is done not for oneself, but for Dhamma. It's duty done for duty's sake. The farmer working his fields, plowing and planting rice in his fields, is doing a low-level kind of duty, and he will receive the, the benefits from doing that duty. The benefits of working one's rice fields is that one harvests rice. So when we do a low-level duty, we, get, we receive some benefits such as rice. But there are higher duties also. And so to, to work the fields of the Buddha, to work the Buddha fields, to plow and plant the Buddha fields, is to be able to harvest the rice of path, fruit, and nibbana. Path means the fulfillment of the middle way, the complete, the completion and perfection of the middle way, which leads to the fruition of that path, the ripening into an arahant, and that is nibbana. So by plowing and planting and working the Buddha fields, there is a harvest of of the rice of Nibbana. This may sound a little strange, but we're trying to help you understand. So to do what this is a high level sort of duty. To to work the Buddha fields means to practice vipassana, to do vipassana, to see clearly things the way they really are, and able to cut through attachments and be free of duty dukkha. To do one's duty on a low level has its benefits, and to truly do one's duty on that level means that there is no dukkha is caused. But to do duty, to do our duty on the highest level is to cut through all dukkha, to cut through all the attachments and defilements, and bring about a complete end to all dukkha. So this is the highest meaning of doing one's duty, is to put an end to dukkha, to put the path completely into effect, to watch it bear fruit, and to realize that fruit, which is Nibbana. Now we come to the fourth sunambanam, universal love. If there is any attachment to self, then there will be selfishness. And when there is this selfishness, then there is no way that we can love anyone else. Even if we love ourselves, that is a wrong kind of love. It's nothing like universal love. And this wrong kind of love, this love of self, this selfishness, becomes a heavy, heavy burden. 
This is the burden of life, selfishness, attachment to self. So long as there is this attachment to self, then there is no true love for other beings. There is just selfishness creating burdens for oneself and problems for others. When we attach to good and evil, this is already selfishness. This is good is what is to our advantage and evil is what is to our disadvantage. So it's already seeing things and attaching on selfish terms. So through attaching to good and evil, there is this selfishness which already makes it impossible to love others. But when there is no more attachment to good and evil, no more attachment to self, then it becomes possible to love others. And this love of others can spread from those near us to those in the immediate vicinity and can spread to the entire world. Through the end of this, of attachment to self, there can be true love for the whole world or for the whole solar system, the whole universe, or the whole cosmos. We don't really know how big the universe or the cosmos is. We don't know how many universes there are. But if there is no self, it becomes possible to love all the universes, how many there are, and all the cosmoses, how many, no matter how many cosmos they are. This is by ending attachment to the self. It's because of the self, attachment to self, that there is attachment to good and evil. And attachment to good and evil is another aspect of attachment to the self. With these, there is no way that there can be any true love. So the way to universal love is by non-attachment to anything as self. Let's look at the importance of universal love. Whenever there is attachment to this, this self-body, this thing here, then there is love for only the self. There is no, there is no love for, other, for others, for other bodies. There's only attachment to this, this body here. And through that, this selfishness, this burden weighs upon the mind. And also we will speak in improper, dishonest ways in, in able to get advantages from others. We'll, we'll steal, we'll inflict harm, we'll do all kinds of terrible things out of this selfishness in order to act to, to fulfill the desires of the self. This is the, the heavy burden both upon ourselves and upon others of attachment to self and of selfishness. This is all because there is only self-love. There is only this selfishly directed love rather than true love which has no discrimination between, between self and others. And so we can see how, how lacking the world is in this universal love these days and all the crises that arise now because of selfishness, because of this self-attachment rather than any universal love. So we can see the importance of universal love by seeing all the problems in a world that lacks universal love. The way to universal love is to end this attachment to self. That's the only way that we can truly love in a universal way. So the new life, this new life that is freedom from attachment to good and evil, which means there is no attachment to self, no selfishness. This new life has the, the, the advantage of this new life is universal love. New life, when there is truly no selfishness, then it becomes possible to love others. And then there is no more 
dishonesty, no more stealing, no more taking advantage of others, no more exploitation and affliction, no more harming, no more inflicting pain. Because through the abandoning of the self, through eliminating this attachment to the self-body, then there can be universal love. This is the advantage of new life. Doing this is to make do the thing that is of most benefit for the world. If we've truly seen how, how sorrowfully bad and how greatly lacking the world is in true love, in universal love, then we'll see that the new life is the bringing of universal love to the world and this is of great benefit to the entire world. So to do this, to bring about new life, is to do the, the thing which is of most need for the world. To, to, to live new life is to make a new world. This new life of freedom from self has the advantage of universal love, which creates a new world, a world of love, of universal love. This is, this is, the, you, <clears throat> this is the meaning of utopia. The perfect, the perfect world that is free of problems is the world that is free of dukkha because there is, it is free of self. So discover new life. Discover a new world that is free of selfishness, free of attachment, free of dukkha. And do the thing which of, is of most need for the world. This is the another advantage of new life. So we can see that new life has these four benefits, these four advantages, the, these four sunambanam that we have described. There is the sunambanam of genuine, true happiness. There is the fullness the totally correct human perfection. There is, duty, there is duty for duty's sake, by which no problems are created, no affliction is caused in the world. And then last is the advantage, the benefit of true peace and quiet is brought to the world through universal love. These are four advantages of new life. These, these benefits are enough. They may be even more than enough to show the, the importance and necessity of new life. So these are the advantages of new life. We hope you are interested in new life. So, finally, in this, at the end of this third talk, I'd like to ask for your forgiveness for talking about something that is so difficult to understand. We apologize for speaking about something so difficult, having to use words in such a difficult way. But we, we apologize for this, but we had to do it. There's, there's no other way. We didn't do this for fun. We did it because it has to be done. So please accept our apologies. And also, we'd like to thank you all for coming here. Thank you for coming to Suan Mok. Without you coming here, Suan Mok would be of no use. So in coming here, you have made Suan Mok useful and meaningful and of benefit. So please accept our apologies and our thanks. And this ends today's talk.